this evening, we consider the topic, I have kept all these things for my youth. This was the phrase that the rich young ruler used on Jesus when Jesus told him what he had to do to have eternal life. Now, the famous street evangelist by the name of Ray Comfort, he always asks a series of questions to test the awareness of people with regard to their sins. And you can look on YouTube and access his street evangelism videos. And his line of questioning usually goes like this. Have you told a lie? Even a white lie? Have you lied your way out of things? How many times have you lied? Invariably, people will say, yeah, I've lied many times. And then his follow-up question would be, what does that make you? Now, people usually take a while, but they end up admitting that they are liars. And that's logical, right? If you lie, uh, you are a liar. Another of his lines of questioning goes like this. Have you stolen something, even something small, something you knew that didn't belong to you and you had no intention of returning it? What does that make you? And the answer that people inevitably give, or, or usually they, they will give is, I'm a stealer. But what they mean is, I'm a thief, right? So that's logical. If you've stolen something and you keep stealing, you think about it, that makes you a thief. And, and usually it takes people a while before they admit to what they have done to admit that this is what they are. He then asks, if God were to judge you now for your lies and for your theft, if you stand in judgment, what would happen? Now, some of his interviewees, they shrug it off. Uh, others, they become angry. And still, some others, they become introspective and they admit that if God were to judge them right now, they would not stand in the judgment. They would go to hell. Now, as we saw last week, in order for us to have true comfort in God, we need to have a knowledge of our sin and misery. We need to have a knowledge of the deliverance of God in order to have that comfort. And so some people who hear Ray Comfort, they go away confounded, disturbed, because while they can see their sin and misery, they're not always willing to receive that message of deliverance. Now, Jesus himself, he does the same thing here. When he encountered this self-sufficient young man, this man who thought he deserved eternal life because he was without sin. And, and so we see that Ray Comfort only followed what Jesus did. Now, this encounter that we have just read in Mark 10, it happened toward the road, uh, on the road toward Judea. Jesus, he was on the last leg of his journey on earth. He was on his way to Jerusalem where he would celebrate the Passover, where he would also give his life as a sacrifice for the sins of the people. And along this journey, he met many, many people. This is where he healed the 10 lepers, but after healing the 10 lepers, only one came back to give thanks, all right? Uh, this is where he also saw the faith and repentance demonstrated by Zacchaeus. He had dinner with him, and thereafter Zacchaeus, in proving his salvation, said, I will repent, I will make restitution, half of all my goods I will give to the poor, and whatever I've taken wrongly from people, I will pay them fourfold back. Zacchaeus, after encountering Jesus, was comforted. He knew his sins and misery, and he knew the deliverance that he had because of Jesus. So even though after giving away half of his goods and four times of what he had stolen, he would be a pauper, yet there was joy in his life. So in this encounter with a rich young ruler, we see three truths that we can take with us. Firstly, we have to acknowledge that many have a genuine interest in eternal life. 
a genuine interest in spiritual things. Secondly, many do think that they can fulfill the requirement for eternal life. And thirdly, many will fail to obtain eternal life. So firstly, many have a genuine interest in eternal life. Or you could say at the very least, there are many who have a genuine interest in religion or in morality, in spirituality. And here, Jesus was traveling to Jerusalem. His fame had already preceded him. And in verse 17, there was someone who came running to Jesus. He knelt down and he asked, good master or good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So we see here that he ran to Jesus. He was enthusiastic. There was something in his heart that he wanted answered, and only Jesus could answer it. So there was a certain urgency. And at first sight, this seems very promising. Here was a man whose disposition toward Jesus was one of urgency and and reverence. We also see here that he knelt down before Jesus. And this kind of attitude was very different from the attitude of the Pharisees. You know, when Jesus was alive, many Pharisees came to him. They even called him rabbi or master, uh, but we know that they were there to trick him. They despised him. But this man, he called Jesus good teacher. You know, whereas most people are indifferent to spiritual things, this man had a certain anxiety over it. And this characteristic is not common among all men, but we must also admit uh, that a great number of people do have concerns like this. And we see this in the Bible. You know, in the Bible, a number of people came to Jesus. Yes, some of them came for feeding. Some of them came for healing but there were those who came genuinely seeking. For example, Nicodemus, he came to Jesus by night. He knew that Jesus was from God. I already gave the example of Zacchaeus. He strained to see Jesus. He knew he needed forgiveness from his sin. Uh, We also know about Mary. She came to anoint the feet of Jesus. She sat at his feet eager to learn. And so when it comes to this rich young ruler, he did have a genuine question. You know, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? But here's where the difference is. While Nicodemus, Zacchaeus, and Mary had a genuine interest that led to salvation, uh, this man, he went away sorrowing because the requirements, they were too great for him. Now, we also see that there are those who have a genuine interest, but they don't take that further step, that necessary step. You know, Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, he was very interested in spiritual things. Uh, Mark 6, verse 20 tells us that Herod feared John, John the baptizer, knowing that he was a just man, a holy man. He observed John, and when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. So even Herod Antipas heard gladly. He went to listen, but Herod did not go far enough. This was the man who listened, was eager, but in the end, he feared his wife more, and he had John the baptizer beheaded. This was also the same with Herod's nephew, Herod Agrippa. In Acts 25, verse 22, Agrippa heard about the apostle Paul, and he was very interested. He actually wanted to talk to Paul, and they met several times. They met over many hours. They talked a long time. He had an interest. But in the end, Herod Agrippa said in Acts 26, verse 28, he said it to Paul, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. Interest in spiritual matters, but not enough. There was a genuine interest that did not go far enough. And the question they might have, the the question that they might have might be genuine enough, like the rich young ruler, what must I do to have eternal life? But 
often when the answer comes back and it requires too much of a person, then it becomes too much for them to accept. So that's the first point. There are people who have a genuine interest in spiritual things, in eternal life, but they are not willing to go further because what comes to them, the requirements, it's too much for them. And so this leads to the second truth. Many think they can fulfill the requirement for eternal life. Now, this rich young ruler, and he's called the rich young ruler because uh, uh, for convenience, the scriptures don't actually call him that title, the rich young ruler. Now, Matthew calls him young in Matthew's gospel. Luke's gospel calls him a ruler, right? And all of the gospels here speak about his riches. So he was young, he was a ruler, he was rich. Uh, so he was a rich young ruler. And he came to Jesus because like the disciples, he thought he found the Christ, the one with the words of everlasting life. And so he asked this question, good master, what must I do to have eternal life? And he wanted to hear Jesus because Jesus had the word of everlasting life. And Jesus responds in verse 18 with this, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Now, what was Jesus doing here? In other words, Jesus here was establishing the man's motive. You know, why have you come to me? Really, why are you asking me for the way to eternal life? Why do you call me good? Because only God is good. Now, Jesus looked at him. This was a young man who ran, very excited, who knelt, very devoted, who acknowledged Jesus' status as a rabbi, you know, there was respect, who called him good. You know, any rabbi would be very happy, oh, how wonderful you've come to see me, but Jesus said, why do you call me good, <laughs> right? You know, why are you asking me this question? There's only one who is good. Jesus here was testing this man's motive. You know, this is what Jesus oftentimes did. There were a multitude of people who followed Jesus. They called him Lord, Lord. In Luke 6, 46, he would tell them straight into their faces, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I tell you to do, All right? So Jesus here was establishing this man's motive. Now, without a doubt, to be sure, we need to understand the culture. The teacher or the rabbi in Jewish cultures was held to be one of the most distinguished uh, offices in the Jewish community. And it was very customary for people to get up, right, to rise up when a rabbi entered into a room. Now, when fathers would enter into the room, children would have to get up. That's their culture. But when a child became a rabbi, and if he were to walk into the room, the father would get up in respect of his son, who was now the rabbi. So it is with that kind of respect that this rich young ruler asked Jesus this question, kneeling down, good master, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But the question is this, was he prepared to obey? Good master knelt down, asked the question, if Jesus is good, if he is a master, if he is to be obeyed, would this rich young ruler obey Jesus? Now, in doing this, in asking this question, Jesus was also establishing this man's theology when he told him only God is good. Now, Jesus is God, and if the man knew that, he would have to obey Jesus. But at any rate, uh, he would have had to obey God who gave the commandment. So Jesus tested him. Only God is good. In order to test to see if this man's understanding of goodness was correct or whether it was superficial. So when Jesus told him, okay, this is the way to eternal life. Obey all the commandments. 
The man said, from young, I have obeyed everything. Now we may look at this and we may say, what arrogance? Or we may look at this and pity him and say, he actually doesn't really know what goodness is. Lah. He actually really doesn't know what obedience is. Lah. We can look at this and we can say, he really doesn't know what it means to obey the commandments, right? He certainly didn't understand how good he had to be because only God is truly good. And when Jesus was saying this, he was trying to establish that your goodness is not good at all. You know, why did the young man say he obeyed everything from childhood? Because in his eyes, he was good, and perhaps he does the same thing that many of us do, right? Uh, we often compare one another when we talk about goodness. You know, all of us here, huh? All of us here, we are good compared to those who are in prison, huh? Correct or not? You know, a disobedient child is not good compared to an obedient child. But if you want to compare an obedient child with God, an obedient child is not good. You know, we can here proclaim our spirituality. We're more spiritual than another person, but when it comes down to it, we're not spiritual at all. So the rich young ruler had a warped sense of goodness. He didn't understand that true goodness is perfection in obedience, that true goodness is sinlessness, and that is why God and only God is good, because He alone is without sin. And that's why Paul says in Romans, there is none righteous, there is none that doeth good. No, not one. No one does good. You know, in one sense, we can admit that people of every tribe, tongue, and nation, and even of other religions, they can do some good, they can be self-sacrificial, but while they may do these things that conform to the law of God, they don't do these things that conform to the law of God perfectly. And when they do good, they are not always motivated with God in mind. So, God, so good is only good if it is God word. So here Jesus was establishing the motive of this young man his understanding of his goodness, whether it was deep or whether it was superficial. And so he was really asking, do you really honor God? Do you really love God? And, and so this man was being put to the test. Did he have a right understanding? Did he have a right understanding of goodness and obedience? Not only to Jesus as a good master, but to God who gave the law. And, and that is why Jesus told him next, what God requires. You know the commandments. Don't commit adultery. That's the seventh commandment. Don't kill others. That's the sixth commandment. Don't steal. You know, that's the eighth commandment. Don't lie to others. That's the ninth commandment. Don't defraud. Don't cheat. Don't covet from others what is not yours. That's the tenth commandment. And then after that, he talked about the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. In other words, have you loved your neighbor as yourself? That's what the law of God requires of you. As question four says, love God and love your neighbors. So what was the response of this young man? In verse 20, he said, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. In other words, all my life I have loved my neighbors as myself. All my life, as he was saying, I have been good like God. In other words, I should therefore, maybe he even had a skip in his heart, maybe therefore I can inherit eternal life. And really, he thought what most people think, that they can fulfill the requirements of eternal life. So in the mind of this rich young ruler, he was looking to do something that would make him worthy to inherit the kingdom. And the thing is, as we have seen, he made several errors. He couldn't see that God's goodness could never be achieved. He dishonored God by lowering God's standard 
to man's standard. He didn't actually love God. He also thought that he kept the commandments of God towards men perfectly. And that is why, thirdly here, Jesus was going to show him how wrong he was, that many will fail to obtain eternal life. So this rich young ruler, he had this mindset that he could keep God's laws, that he could be good like God. But in verse 21, Jesus said, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come, take up the cross, and follow me. Now, dearly beloved, to be very sure, right, we have to affirm that we cannot keep any commandments to be saved. But Jesus here was kind. Jesus wanted to show to this young man that his concept of goodness was flawed, that his concept of obedience was flawed. And so Jesus upped the ante a bit and really made it very stark. If you really want to be like God, then give up everything that you have. Give it to the poor, sell it, give the money to the poor and come and follow me, All right? Now, we say, we see here that Jesus said, one thing thou lackest. Now, Jesus was kind in his words. It wasn't just one thing he lacked. This man lacked many things. But this was the main thing that he needed to do. This was the main thing that he needed to know in order to know that he was not good. He thought he was good. He never stole. He never, you know, he loved his neighbors perfectly in his mind. And so Jesus told him, okay, in that case, go and sell all your possessions, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And we see in verse 22, he was sad at that saying and went away grieved, for he had many possessions. So straight away, we see this. He said, good master. And Jesus previously said, you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do the things that I say. So good master, he would be expected to obey, right? But he went away grieved. He didn't obey Jesus. Furthermore, when Jesus told him to sell all that he had, Jesus was in one sense saying, you think you've done everything all your life according to the good standard God requires to have eternal life? Let me show you that you haven't. Give to the poor. You cannot, ah. then you're stealing from them. You said you're good from young, but you're not obeying me, you liar. You can't even do this, you're not God. You say you have not killed, but you won't even do this to inherit eternal life? You're killing yourself. You won't do this because you love your money too much? You're covetous. You won't do this in order to please God and me, whom you call good master? You're prostituting yourself to your wealth. You've coveted your wealthy condition, which is temporary instead of desiring after everlasting life in heaven. You call me good, but you dishonor me by disobeying me. And you call God good, but you don't even obey him. You don't only love yourself more than others, therefore breaking the second table of the law, you love yourself more than you love God, therefore breaking the first table of the law. Now, what I have spoken, I've spoken tongue in cheek in the way that I would have said it. Our Lord was kind. He did not say it that way. But you can imagine that all that I have said is comprehended in what Christ said kindly towards this young man. And this young man knew that though he said he was good, that he truly wasn't. Now the reason for the failure to obtain eternal life is several fold. 
Not only is it impossible to keep the law perfectly, but very often it's our self-sufficiency that deludes us to think we're good. And that is why Jesus said in verse 23, it is hard for the rich to enter heaven. And of course, we're not saying that rich people cannot enter heaven because all of us could not enter heaven because we're all rich here, right? But Jesus clarified himself in verse 24. It's not that being rich prevents one from being saved. Rather, as it's clarified in verse 24, it's those who trust in riches. Rather than trusting in God, seeing their sinfulness, their bankrupt condition, very often, those who trust in riches, it is their riches that deceive them into thinking that they're okay. You know, rich people oftentimes think that God is pleased with them. And they don't, in that one sense, uh, generally speaking, sin as much in the obvious sense. They don't need to steal because they're rich. They don't need to covet because if they just want something, they just go and buy it, lah, right? Uh, and so, therefore, their riches justify their sins. And it's so easy, you know, uh, for this rich young ruler as a rich man to keep the letter of the law. You know, it's so easy for people who are comfortable in life to appear respectable because we don't murder, we don't steal, we don't do any of these things. It deludes us. And that is why Jesus said, a man who trusts in his riches, it is very hard for him to enter the kingdom of heaven because he doesn't think he is bad. And so this rich young ruler proves this point because he didn't think he was bad until Jesus upped the ante and really showed him the standard of God. And only then did he realize that he could not obtain everlasting life unless he were to give up his self-sufficiency, unless he would surrender his heart. And Jesus got to the real heart issue. Now, dearly beloved, to be clear, I believe that all of us here are in the same league as this rich young ruler. I've oftentimes said none of us here are poor. All of us actually are quite rich. Yes, there are different levels of wealth, but we have a roof over our head. We can buy food. We can travel, uh, whether locally or internationally. So this is where the rubber hits the road. How can we be saved if we trust in riches? How could we have ever been saved if we are exactly like this rich young ruler? And Jesus himself said, it is easier for a camel to enter into the eye of a needle than a man who trusts in his riches to enter heaven. You know, even his disciples asked that question, how can this be? And Jesus answered in verse 27, what is impossible with man is possible with God. This rich young ruler here, as far as we can see, he did not at this point in time obtain eternal life because he was self-sufficient. He did not truly see his sins against the law. But there's one thing encouraging here. This rich young ruler went away sorrowing. His confidence was shaken. Now he knew the real teaching of the law, how exact the law is, the kind of goodness, perfection, God's perfection that we must meet in order to obtain eternal life. And this is where he went away sad and sorrowing because he would have seen his own sins and misery. And that's what Heidelberg question three asks, from where do you know your sins and misery? From the law of God. And now, instead of seeing it as something he could keep or had kept, he now saw it as something that he could not keep. You know, this encounter with Jesus is wonderful that this rich young ruler went away sorrowing. Jesus looked upon him and loved him. This was a kind word from Jesus, right? And Jesus said, what is impossible with man? 
a self-sufficient young man to be ever to be saved. What is impossible with man is possible with God. Take a look at verse 21. In verse 21, when Jesus looked at him and gave him the commandment, we see here that Jesus looked at him and loved him. This teaching of the law that Jesus gave was not meant to destroy this rich young ruler. It was meant to shake him up. It was meant to save him. Now, when we talk about this word love, it gives us a bit of hope here. Now, we know that God is patient. God is good to all men. But God only loves his people. He will save them. And so when Jesus was preaching this law to this young man, it was so that this young man would turn from his sins, acknowledge his sinfulness, his inability to be good, and to run to Christ. You know, Jesus taught the law, and we know that the law is a schoolmaster to lead people to Christ. And when we look at this, we should not be too discouraged when it says he went away sad and grieved. Now, this word grieved is too mild a word in English. The original word is something deeper. It is more devastating. Or you could say that this word grieved means devastated. Uh, The commandment that God, that Christ gave him, shocked him. He was appalled. You know, he who ran to Jesus uh, initially now walked away from Jesus. Uh, And because he saw his sin and misery and saw that by nature he was inclined to hate God and his neighbor, he was shaken at his core. But God loved him and saved him. Now, Christ was the only man who kept the law perfectly because he was God. He never killed but was always pure. He always listened and obeyed the will of the Father. He never stole. He never coveted his glory. But what he did was this. Christ laid aside his glory in order to become a man. He let himself be killed in order to give life to his neighbors. He took upon himself the sins and impurities of adulterers and idolaters in order to purify them. He bore the lies and the false witnesses of his enemies in order so that he could give them the truth of the gospel. And he willingly and generously gave his life for his enemies, those who were poor in righteousness, that they might be rich And so, this rich young ruler, he walked away. Do we know what happened to him? The text doesn't tell us, but here is where, and I think it's permitted here, that we read beyond the text. We see here that Jesus loved him. Jesus preached the law to him to shake him up so that he would run back to the only person who could give him eternal life, the one who had clean hands and pure heart. You know, and that is a wonderful God uh, that he has done this for us. Now, we read here that Jesus loved him, and so I believe that he was saved. And if we are to believe church tradition Uh, as well as certain clues in the Bible, we may even conclude that this rich young ruler was none other but John Mark, the writer of this gospel. He was the son of a rich woman in Jerusalem. Uh, And how do we know this? We can't be too dogmatic about this. But one of the distinctive ways that Mark writes his gospel is his use of the Greek word ephthios, which means straight away. And this word straight away is found more often in Mark's gospel than all the other gospels combined. And perhaps, perhaps the reason is this. John Mark, if he is the rich young ruler here, 
When told to sell everything he had and to give to the poor, you know, when confronted with this word of Christ to shake him up from his works righteousness, he did not obey. He walked away. He delayed. He went away sorrowing. And perhaps it was because it was too large a price to pay. Perhaps, if it is him, he later repented, he fulfilled the commandment of God, and he remained remorseful, which is why perhaps he always uses that word straight away, always in his gospel. And so as we come to the end of this sermon, as we look at this text here, what is the application for us? Let me speak firstly to those in church, from church, who have been longtime Christians. We know the gospel. We come to church. We serve in church. There's a semblance of righteousness. But dearly beloved, in what ways do we still have a works righteousness in us? Perhaps it could be, I'm more spiritual than others. You know, I'm godlier than they are. Perhaps it is that you think to yourself, I've served all my life, I've been in church, there's nothing significantly wrong with me. The answer comes back to us. Go and sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. And thereby you will know that there's still sin in you and that you're not perfect and that there's still so much lacking in you that you must go to Christ, to that perfect man, to receive again that gospel, to receive that forgiveness, to realize that there is still no good in you. I speak secondly to those who have grown up in church, who have heard the gospel. Because you grew up in Christian families, you have learned a certain Christian behavior. But you know yourself the kinds of sins that you have, the secret sins of your hearts, boys and girls, the hatred that is in your heart, the covetousness, the language that you use. Again, the word to you is go. If you want to inherit eternal life, you either must be perfect before God or you must come to Christ and you must cry out to him for salvation. The third word is to our friends here who are yet unbelieving. The law of God has been preached. God is good. Only God is good. You are not. And if you are to inherit eternal life, you must come to the God-man, Jesus Christ. He is the one who can save you because you can't save yourself. And when you see your sins and misery, that is the only way you can receive comfort when you know the deliverance is from Christ. Let us pray together. Eternal and gracious Father in heaven, how thankful we are for your word. Even as we read through Mark 10, to hear about the rich young ruler, help us to see ourselves in him as people who proclaim our own goodness but are actually not good enough. And then help us to see Christ and only Christ who has been good enough, who takes upon us our sins, who takes from us our sins upon himself to save those who are willing to run to him. We commit ourselves to your care. Be gracious, O Lord, to work in our hearts. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.